What is up, NHL fans? Hope you had a great weekend. We're officially in March. We are in trade deadline week. There's a lot to catch up on from the weekend. Alongside Kobe Cohen, I'm Johnny Lazarus. This is Morning Cup of Hockey. And today we're going to talk about some of the playoff scenarios in the East and the West and the 16 teams that are shaping up to make it. We're going to talk some Leafs Rangers from Saturday night, Elias Pettersson's new deal, which Kobe and I basically predicted the exact dollar amount it would don't, be hey hey don't give me credit there you yeah, that was all me actually you 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 take the wins when you can get them buddy that was, that, was a, that was a big win for you thank you thank you and then we're gonna talk about Evgeny Kuznetsov um and his situation going on in Hershey so a lot to get into but get in the chat we'll answer a lot of chat questions today it's just gonna be Colby and I for today's show but before we get going into anything Colby I gotta give, give you some snaps for uh coaching your team your u18s to a championship over the weekend you want to talk about it well you can hear my voice is is a little uh raspy today um but we we had our our atlantic youth hockey league playoffs this weekend this is our 18u um premier triple a team and uh we went into the playoffs as a four seed so we we had to take out the number one seed friday night um, which we did. We didn't give up a goal. And then Saturday, uh, excuse me, Friday, it was Saturday, Sunday. We won in overtime on Sunday, one nothing, um, which, which was awesome against my former youth team, the junior flyers. So there was a lot of, you know, excitement to, to win that game. And, and, you know, it's funny, I, I was a junior flyer as a, as a really young hockey player. And then I switched to the Titans as I got a little bit older um, and then we had this big rivalry with the junior flyers. And one of the guys that I coach with George Havlin, uh, he, he runs the whole organization. It's, it's, it's his, you know, it's his building and organization. Um, you know, we, we won some hardware, we raised some banners in that exact building 20 years ago. So, so it was a lot of fun. And did you get a tribute um, video? I didn't get a tribute video. So, <laughs> so, Nick, so Nick Alberga can't, can't say anything negative about me. Although I think, he would he he would have okayed a tribute video in in that regard um, from my old youth hockey days. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you something. I, I I got into this you know coaching with this team you know what about four months ago now whatever it's been the season and you know I've never coached before and I got to tell you it's it's a lot of fun. It really is. I mean working with these kids, um, these, these youth Titans players. I mean, I work with the junior team, the NA team, the U 18s, the U 16s and, and on down. And, and it's fun. Like, and when you see the things that you work on for weeks and weeks in practice, and we really worked on a couple of things, like, um, we really got our structure together in a way that we wanted to play for like the last six weeks. And we hammered them in practice, hammered them. And, seeing it all come together for playoffs this weekend it was it was really it was probably one of the most fun weekends of hockey i've <laughs> ever had in my life not not yeah. not kidding yeah. i've had a lot of great moments as a player um as a, as a broadcaster but it, it was it was really cool watching these these kids who are 17 years old mostly some 18 really buy into an identity as a hockey team and look we're not the sexy eight seven team like we have to play a certain way to win and and getting young you know young men you know they're all 17 18 years old to buy into that this weekend and mm -hmm. our fourth line our third line like our skill guys it was really cool to watch these guys commit to each other and sacrifice because that's what it takes even at a young age to really be successful in the playoffs so um give give a lot of love and shout out to my u18 guys um you know the junior team had a big weekend as well for the titans they had a big sweep of maryland was the first place team in their league um but it it was really cool like i i was i had an ear-to-ear -ear smile on my face um honestly at one point it was almost like emotional and i kind of had to fight it a little bit just because i was so happy for that for those guys like it, it just you know, watching how much effort they put into it. It, it was cool. It, it really was. So um, I wanted to start by giving those guys some love. Um, we've got, now we got to win two games in a best of three series. We got the bye. Um, and if we win two out of three, we go to nationals with our U18 team in, in Vegas. So um, sick. It, it would be a lot of fun yeah. to do. Uh, it would be the week between 
regionals and frozen four. So it could be a busy, busy three weeks for me if, if we, uh, were able to, to pull that off. So shout out to, to, uh, to my group and, and Danny Howard and Jimmy Gill. And, and I already said George Haviland, but, uh, um, ton, ton of fun this weekend for me. Like I, I was thrilled to be back in a youth hockey rink. I really was something that I didn't think I ever would, would, would say, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, um, thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate yeah. it. I know you uh, played in a pond hockey tournament this weekend. Finally got to wear your new skates, right? No, I didn't wear them. I didn't wear them. Oh. I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to, you know, I played seven hockey games throughout the day. I, I didn't want my feet to kill with new skates, uh, <laughs> but I will be breaking them in at some point, but yeah, I, I gotta give a shout out to, um, played in a great, great charity pond hockey tournament at Chelsea Piers for the I rise above foundation, uh, which has to do with breast cancer. And it was put on by Northern Roots Hockey. We raised over sixty thousand dollars. So, um, pretty cool tournament. There's eight different teams. Each team has a former NHL player. Our former NHL player was Morris Lukowicz, who spent a lot of time with the Winnipeg Jets. Um, so it was cool. He was handing out like autograph pictures and um, you know telling stories from his days. He talked about how Paul Coffey like laid him out one game, and he kind of talked shit with Paul Coffey. Um, you know, another guy we played against was Bernie Nichols, who is an NHL legend. Yeah. Um, and he's dude, he, he moves, he's like 63 years old. He's good. His team won the whole tournament. Um, he was basically like playing. How did goalie. your team do? We won the first game in low and then lost six straight, <laughs> okay. but, uh, we had some beers. We had some fun. We had some, why laugh. didn't, why didn't you recruit your boy, Alexi Lafreniere? That would have been sick. I would have loved that, but he was too busy. We've already, we've already got Lafreniere in the chat. We've already, yeah, we, we already got people in the chat. We're, we're, I promise you, we're going to get to that Rangers Leafs game. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to start today's show looking kind of at the East West scenarios mm -hmm. and, and what's going on in the NHL, because we're, we're in March here. I think we're kind of coming down to it and it's looking like we know probably at least 15, 14 of the 16 teams that are going to be in the four teams. Yeah. I'm going to say, um, it's, it's looking that way. And, uh, a friend of the show, uh, John Butchergross actually put this out on Twitter, which which I think sparked um, a little bit of debate. And he started by saying, OK, I think we have our 16 playoff teams. I don't see anyone climbing the ladder. Time for a million trades. I do still think the Islanders could potentially sneak in there. They could. Um, and, you know, in the West, I think that wild card, we could see a little bit of drama on that wild card. I don't think we will, but we could. Well, there's um, one team I wanted to mention in the West, Colby, that's not getting enough love, I feel like. And that's the Minnesota Wild. The Minnesota Wild have been playing pretty well since, you know, mid-January. They're the, the sixth best team in the NHL. And you look at some numbers. Kirill Kaprizov, since then, he's fourth in the NHL in scoring. 16 goals, 16 assists in 20 games. He's really stepped up for Minnesota. last night or the night before? Yeah. yeah. Hattrick, yeah. Hattrick yesterday, I believe. He's really stepped it up for the Wild. I mean, I know it was against San Jose, but still, like... Kaprizov has been unbelievable, and I feel like not a lot of people have given love to Minnesota, which, you know, I, I don't give love to them. They've been so mid for the past couple of years, but, you know, Billy You know Garen, who's given love to them? Frank, who? on on, yeah? on Daily Faceoffs uh, Live. Mm -hmm. He's been saying for probably about a month and a half that he could see them making a little bit of a push. and, and Because well, Billy Garen is one... Them he's one to do that right like yeah he seems like a guy who is willing to go all in even if his team is on the bubble well but i also think john hines can inspire a team and and can simplify a team defensively i i know hines going back to to um my days with with the national development team and he he knows how to put a plan in place his teams going back to Devils teams, um, and then I remember just playing against him when he was head coach in the American League in Wilkes-Barre, and it sucked playing against his teams. They always had an mm -hmm. identity, um, and they were always, um, you know, hard to hard to beat. But eight points is going to be hard to make up, Johnny. Like you've got to win. You've got to go on like a five or six game heater and hope, and then hope the other team loses. And and that's the hard part right now. Is like we were talking about this yesterday. Um, the Flyers could lose, could go nine and 12 to finish the year and still make the playoffs. Like mm -hmm. when you, it's hard to make up points like that this time of year, unless one team loses 10 straight and one team wins eight or nine straight. So it is, if teams are win one, lose one, win two, lose one, you're not, you're not climbing. 
you're just not. So, well, um, I think Bucci said that because, you know, the Devils and Capitals both had great chances to make up some ground against Philly and Washington loses on home ice to Arizona. The Devils lose back-to-back -back games to the Ducks and then the Kings. Like those are games you have to win. You, well, you the Kings to. are the Kings have played better. I mean, they're seven and three in their the last Ducks game, game, though. The Ducks game, the Devils yeah. outshoot them like fifty-five to twenty-three. Jack yeah. Hughes gets the penalty shot, doesn't get a shot off. Like you know that that is games. kind of the that that that's their season in a nutshell, right there. Yeah. It really is. I mean, you get. Uh, you get all that opportunity. And then you got a team like the Preds who are buzzing eight in a row. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of wonder though, like does, does selling help them long-term? Like, I don't know. Um, you know, like they're not a team that's going to compete for a Stanley cup right now. So does getting in and, and spending eight days in the playoffs, does that stunt your, your sort of retool that you're kind of involved in with Barry Trotz as your GM? I know people were saying that Tommy Novak could go out and, fetch you like maybe a you know a first round pick and yeah you know i, I thought i saw extension talk for him now after and now but well yeah, and then he right? goes out and has i'm just saying like yeah. you know those are the questions that you weigh johnny and when when you make the when you're making the playoffs as an eight seed you don't want to you don't want to sell but how much how realistic is it that you're going to win so but but let's let's go back to butchie's tweet because this yeah. is where the debate started to come in and we want everyone in the chat to, to weigh in on this because, um, you know, not only did Butchie tweet this and Johnny, do you want to read it since my voice is a little bit, uh, rat, you know, shit today? Yeah, I can do it. Uh, so John Butchross originally tweeted, okay, I think we have our 16 NHL playoff teams. Don't see anyone climbing the ladder time for a million trades. Let's go. And then quoted it with unquestionably the playoffs should be expanded. Good for business. Four of six teams used to make the playoffs. Eventually 16 of 21 now 16 of 32. And, I feel well, hold like on. We had this hold on. Play. Oh, Ray Ferraro. Now let's let's see. Like, go to Ray's tweet okay. because Ray Ferraro is a well-respected voice in hockey, along with Butchie. They're both well-respected. Butchie not afraid to, you know, be creative. Butchie is an mm -hmm. artist and a creative. Now Ray's a little more of a, a serious, traditional hockey guy, right? Read yeah. Ray's tweet for us, Johnny. Ray said, agreed, would love division winners seated one to two, each conference number three through six seated by points. Team seven to 10 play two of three to become seven, eight seeds, one versus eight, et cetera, in first round. And okay, Ray Ferraro is basically just explaining what the NBA has been doing now the past couple of years. And I've said right. this, I feel like on our show before about the NHL doing playing games. I, I feel like we did either. We talked about this on the show or maybe you and I just talked about it in general, but the NHL is really the only league now that doesn't reward division yeah. winners at all. They don't. Like the NFL has a buy, MLB gets a buy, and the NBA now has the play-in. Well, not so everyone in the NFL gets a buy, but I. But you're right. But you know what there I mean? There is reward. There's the reward. The division winners have rewards. Home games, rewards. There, there are rewards. Like the NHL, yes, you get home ice advantage, but there, there's no real reward for winning your division. Like there's not, and there should be. I think with Ray's tweet. You know, let's say, like, the, like I guess the Vancouver Canucks right now. I think they're are they still the the the, the league wide uh, number one right now? Let me check. But you know I mean, what I mean. They've been jockeying oh, Florida, back and forth right yeah. now. Yeah. So the Florida Panthers, let's say, they should be able to to play a team that just played a two out of three in a playoff series. So they have a little bit more of a physical advantage. Let's say, you know, just like the NFL does, right? Because. Uh, you know, there's there's what the the wild card plan, and then the, that team goes to play the divisional divisional round. That's how the NFL works. Um, so, what do you think about that? Because I I've been saying that now since the NBA started doing it. Because not only is it good just for the fans, you know, the Minnesota Timberwolves when they're playing game and Patrick Beverly's taking his shirt off, standing in, you know, it looks like they won the NBA finals. But like fans love it. It's just it's just more playoff atmosphere. It creates more teams. It creates uh, just a better energy. I think for the overall league but yeah look i'm i'm not i'm not against it um mm -hmm. at all because the intensity of playoff hockey like is great the only thing i would say and and jeremiah actually is is yeah i just saw that back in sunny alaska as he pointed out to us his um his florida vacation is over but uh I do think you need to probably start the season a, t a tad bit earlier because i i don't think we want to go later in june than june 15th like mm -hmm. and and here's the other thing Teams that go to the Stanley Cup into mid-June, 
like you do need time to rest and recover. So starting in early September, as opposed to October, that could be a little difficult as well. So I, I do think the intensity of the schedule, you got to remember like in these other sports in basketball, I mean, I know they pretend like it's a physical sport and they talk about the physicality of basketball, but like, it's kind of laughable. Um, the playoffs are a little bit more intense, but okay. I'm not saying they're intense. not intense, but yeah. don't call them physical. Yeah. Like intense. Fine. It's intense, but it's not physical. Mm. I mean, I, I laugh at that when it I used hear to be. basketball used to be. analysts call calling it physical. Um, that always kind of makes me laugh and, and football, it's a shorter season, but I mean, there's that, that's a brutal sport. It's, yeah. it's a really brutal sport, but you know, they don't hit pretty much all year other than games. Like they don't even hit in practice anymore in, in the mm-hmm. NFL, you know, they do a little bit, uh, you know, but like, I remember when my cousin who, who was drafted by the Eagles back in the day, um, he was a skier, a pretty well-known guy, Jeremy Bloom, his training camps, when he played, he was drafted in 2006 by the Philadelphia Eagles. And I went to his first training camp. Those, those guys used to brutalize each other. And like now they don't even wear pads. Most of training camp there's, there are padded practice, but it's not a lot. So I think that's one thing you just have to make sure you're, you're cognizant of, um, and, and, you know, not expanding the season where it's running into each other on either end, but I'm not against the idea, um, of, of giving teams on the, you know, right on the bubble opportunities to win two out of three is like, I yeah. would think those would be those two out of threes would be bloodbaths. Like they even would. just a one game plan, even a one game. Yeah. I like I like the idea of of two out of three. Um, mm-hmm. but you're right, one game plan that that doesn't that doesn't have to be that could be one day. You know that's not. Yeah, you could have all the plans in in two days. So like, how much is that really hurting your schedule? But I I think it's an interesting point because how many hockey fans and obviously we're we're the extreme. Um, and, and all of our listeners are probably watching all the playoffs and all the regular season as well. But there's also a lot of people out there that they're just playoff hockey watchers, you yeah. know? So, so we, we, we're giving more people more playoff hockey because everybody admits it. Even people from other sports, uh-huh. there's nothing like playoff hockey. There's nothing well, like it. Actually to that point, if you do like, let's say seven verse 10, eight verse nine, and it's one game that's essentially four game sevens right off the bat to kick off the NHL playoffs. Right. Like that's how, that's how it would be. Right. It's, it is a game seven. You're playing to get in. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Know, Neil, Neil said, do you shorten the season 72 games? It'll never happen. Owners are not giving up five home games um, each or, you know, five because you'd have five home. If, if it, it just, it's never going to happen. Ticket revenue in the NHL is everything. When you look at the breakdowns of what they they generate their revenue from, the NHL relies on gate revenue. They're not giving up ten regular season games. It'll that'll never ever be on the table. Um, mm. You look at every other sports league; it's mostly trying to get more games, not less. It's it's not uh, that'll never happen uh, at all. D. Ely just said. Uh... If they did expand the playoffs, would have to be a two out of three, and second round could be a best of five. Start your best of seven in the third round. I don't know. If I, I don't like that. that. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. that I I love yeah. the best of sevens. There, there's yeah. the the better team is going to win in a best of seven. Like there's there's no there's not going to be flukes in a best of seven. It's whoever is the better team. Uh, for even if it's only you only have to be better for a week, okay? But you got to be the better team consistently over the course of more than a week, two weeks, sorry, um, in, a, in a best of seven. And, and I love the integrity of that. I really do. Mm-hmm. I agree. And, and I know we were talking about the deadline a little bit and, and what teams should maybe start selling right now. There's one team I actually want to ask you about. I was in a New Jersey Devils Twitter spaces or Twitter circle last night for about an hour. And Devils fans are starting to you know question if they should even be buyers at the deadline right now because of where they stand. You know, currently 64 points. They're six points back of, or eight points back, excuse me, of Tampa Bay. But they're really chasing the Flyers, who are, uh, you know, third in the Metro right now with 71 points. So they're seven points back of Philly, um, just because you know they. Who's, and Philly's about to get Travis Konechny back. They've been out without Travis Konechny, who's who's there. You know, he he's kind of their, he's the engine of that mm-hmm. offense. Like he kind of 
keeps that engine going. So he, here's all I would say is with the Devils, yeah. unless you can get a goalie, don't buy. You'd be silly to buy because you're not winning anything without goaltending. And that's that's still going to be a problem next year, by the way, for them. So whether it's now um, or the offseason, it sounds like the Jacob Markstrom thing has been put to bed. Doesn't mean it has. Just sounds mm -hmm. like it has. Well, I um, thought their deal with uh, with Dallas and their involvement with the Tanev deal was to try to, you know, I, I guess soften that up a little bit so they can do a deal with Calgary because they well, took on some money. I mean, that was you surmising, and mm -hmm. that was me agreeing with you, thinking maybe, but mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean it's a guarantee of anything. I mean, the Calgary Flames came out and and said like we're, or or maybe they didn't come out and say it, but the, you know the people who are who are the insider said like it's been put to bed like markstrom's not moving um you know in these canadian markets if you can make the playoffs as an eighth seed even if you lose like those those are big games in a place like calgary to have a couple of home games not saying they're going to yeah they're seven points back still the, the more they subtract the more they win though they've you know what i mean it's like bizarre but they're going to trade hannafin um they're going to they're going to get worse like, they're not going to be able to keep uh keep that going by any means but you know, look, I, I think you, you look at, you know, Vic, throw the East, throw the Eastern, uh, the, the Eastern Conference back up for us if you can. But look, the Islanders have have had a little bit of a of a spark uh, of life. Um, you know, it's the it's the uh, the morning cup of bump. Anytime, <laughs> anytime I, I get in after anyone, um, the, the bump happens. Uh, but and, and look, I think it takes time with a new head coach. They seem to be playing a little bit of a of a tighter style. Um, Dude, they won three the straight game, games against good teams. They beat Dallas on the road. They beat Detroit on the road, and then they beat Boston at home five to one. Like that's that's no joke. That's no joke. And look, Boston hasn't played great, but those are good wins. They're really yeah. good wins, and they're they got to be confident. But all I would say again is, you're chasing, and I'm going to go back to this Flyers situation. Mm -hmm. Nothing tells me the Flyers are not going to not continue to find ways to be consistent. They might win one, lose one, win one, lose one, but that's good enough for them to make the playoffs. Is that consistent um, though? I, I'm just that that wouldn't be a consistent. I guess that's consistently game, winning and losing one. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, like nothing tells me that they're not going to continue to find ways to win hockey games, even if they win one and lose one. They've done it all season. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to jump off the, the wagon of thinking that they're going to continue to win enough to find their way into the playoffs. It, it may not happen, but I'm very confident that it is like I nothing the Islanders have done over the, the 60 games that they've played. Tell me that they're going to go um, and, and win 10 in a row. Uh, it just doesn't. If they do right, well, it, it's for them. But, but I'm just, I'm just looking at uh, both teams schedules here, though, the next few games. So the Islanders are home against St. Louis tomorrow night. Then they go on their Western California trip. Listen to the Islanders schedule and then listen to the Flyers schedule the next like five or so games. Here's the Islanders home against St. Louis in San Jose, in Anaheim, in L.A., in Buffalo, home against Ottawa. That's their next six games. This is a they got to win five out of six. Then you look at Philly. Philly, again, they're home against the Blues, just like the Islanders. Then Philly's in Florida in Tampa, they host San Jose, they host Toronto in Boston, and then host Toronto again, and then the Hurricanes. The schedules right now, this is this window, this six-game window is the this Islanders' is their window. chance to cover some ground. If they this do not win at least four out of six, they're fucked. Yeah. Fucked. I would agree. Mm -hmm. um, like I, that, I, that, I, that little schedule thing is, yeah, is huge. It, it's huge, but you know, look, the Flyers have wins against big, you know, other top end teams all year. They do. They just mm -hmm. beat Tampa at home. Um, Florida will be tough. They've played Toronto tough. They've got to, you know, so again, like it, it, it doesn't scare me for the Flyers because they, they've, they've been up to the test. They've played better against the better teams, honestly. So, mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. And then you've got the Pittsburgh Penguins who, I mean, you know, to sell everything, it, it's Game, it's everything. They, it's it's an abomination what what has become in Pittsburgh. I mean, when did Ryan Graves stop being a good defenseman in the NHL? He was I good mean, for the Devils last year, and they got rid of he, him. 
he's he's struggling i mean that whole team is struggling but like man he he struggles i i mean it's the kyle dubas defenseman curse Mm -hmm. um wow like they look disinterested in playing hockey and people are now like should crosby go he's not going at the trade deadline i mean there's no way that's happening at the trade deadline let me give you like a hypothetical though if uh there's no way Let's say the Leafs lose round one again. Round one again, does Sheldon Keith get canned and then go to Pittsburgh? Take Mike Sullivan's I mean, job. I mean, I I have no idea. Like that's you couldn't see that happening. I mean, I I just don't I don't know. I, mean, I could see a coach's swap there. <laughs> how good How good is the relationship with Dubas and Keith? Like I, I have no idea. I'm pretty sure they're boys. That's why he got the job to begin with, right? I mean, yeah, but they, they were boys, but then they spent what four or five years together. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, those, those relationships, uh, they can deteriorate and he, he, he coached for him at the Marlies, the Sioux. So yeah. Okay. Like maybe, I mean, look, Mike Sullivan in Toronto would be a huge difference maker. I think that'd be a a great fit. I mean, he, he would, he would get the the star players to listen and look up Mm -hmm. because he did it in Pittsburgh for a very long time. And I, look, I don't think this is a Mike Sullivan problem, though. I think this no. is a, a roster construction problem, and I don't think yeah, Ben Sullivan's Sports been there for so long. It might just be time to start a new chapter, you know? Maybe, but Mike Mike Sullivan just got like a four or five year contract extension this oh, year. Oh, really? Yeah, he's got oh, a lot of years that's left. Right. He was talked about last um, year with uh, you know potential for the Rangers if they fired him last year and stuff like that. I remember that actually. So I I think Fenway Sports Group really likes. Mike Sullivan. They're all Boston guys. Um, I think there's there's a lot of trust and faith there. I, I think this is roster construction. Who knows? You know, maybe Sully doesn't survive it. Maybe it's like Andy Reid after in Philadelphia having an unbelievable run. It was just time, and then he goes to Kansas City, and we we know what the run has been like for him there. That does happen in sports, but um, I don't know. I I I maybe, maybe the coaches swap. Um, but you know, look, Toronto's nine and one in their last 10 games, Johnny. And, and, you know, going back to that Leafs Rangers game the other night, this is the first time all season Toronto looks like a serious hockey team. I mean, mm-hmm. they really do like the, the way that they're playing. They, they look like they could win some games in the playoffs, the way they're that defending. Was a great game. That was a great um, game. The commitment to, for the most part, stopping on pucks, you know, not turning pucks over, managing the first goal. <laughs> for the most part, for the yeah. most part, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think Toronto, they, they look like a serious hockey team and, and it sounds like they're still trying to add. I mean, it really does. It sounds like they've been very active, um, trying to continue to bolster their defensemen. Colton Pareko is a name that we keep hearing linked to them. Look, I love Colton Perenko in the short term for Toronto. He has a lot of years left on his contract at 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 a I don't know the exact number. Maybe Vic, you can look that up for us as we as we keep rolling through here. Um, I think it's I want to say somewhere in the sixes is his cap hit. Um I I, I it's, it's not a it's not a horrible cap hit for a guy. Six point five. Six point five till uh through through twenty six, twenty seven. Okay, so Oh no 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 longer 28 29. But look, if 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 the Leafs could could get him, I I I think that would be a good decision. I think he he adds an element to that back end that they do not have. That they do not big physical two way guy. Slap shot is a is an absolute bomb. Plays power play. Plays penalty kill. Brings a lot. Um, brings brings a lot to to a team. So, um. That was your that was a big game against the Rangers. That was a that was a big Eastern Conference uh you know heavyweight tilt, Johnny. So so what did what did you think of that of that game? I mean, if you weren't watching the Rangers and Leafs Saturday night, like you missed just just good old time, old fashioned hockey. That game had everything. It had skill, it had physicality, it had fighting, it had the theatrics. I mean, it was it was everything I think people wanted that game to be, aside from it going to a shootout. I think everyone would have been happier. Had the game ended in overtime. Me personally, I was, you know, cackling to myself when Lafreniere opened the game uh, with that beautiful goal, an absolute snipe that or, Willie Nylander does a flyby on. Uh, if you want to break I mean, it down, Kobe, this is all you. 
I mean, this is an eleven and a half million dollar flyby. Watch, watch Willie Nylander just buzz right by Adam Fox at the point. Just no effort to make that play. And look, Foxy makes a great play there. He gloves it down. There's a lot of deception, little stutter step, little pass into the middle to Lafreniere, who who makes a great shot around a screen. But, but just look at this man, picture. Let, Eleven and a half million dollar, no move, no trade. Willie Styles just blowing the zone in a zero zero game. I mean, that is as bad of a minus as you can catch um, for for Willie Nylander. And then he got benched. Uh, he got benched, which which he should get benched for that type of effort because that just is a big fuck you to your teammates. Like mm. when you make a play like that in that game, that's a fuck you zero to zero game on early on too. It's like you got to be bought in it, there. It's, but what, what, so, so what's so funny to me about this whole situation too, is like the minute Lafreniere scores that goal, my mentions are flooded with mm -hmm. people and even Bleacher Report put out a tweet and said the road to 100 yeah. for Lafreniere, which is hysterical. And people um, think that I post that I don't run any of the Bleacher Report accounts that, that had nothing to do with me. That well, but, but here's my question. On. The last yeah. three games, Lafreniere had no points. Mm -hmm. No points. Didn't mean he didn't play well. Because we we've said he's a good player. Okay. Yeah. You 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 think you know he had I no think he's been their last... best player in the last five games. Okay, but he had three games where he didn't have points. And here mm -hmm. here's what I'm gonna tell you. Okay. If if Artemi Panarin is visible and invisible in a hockey game. Look at the score sheet. He's on it for two assists. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are the players that score 100 points in the NHL. Players that are never not on the score sheet. I know well, I'm although, stating the obvious, but there's too many gaps in this guy's games to, to, to get him close, even close to the 100 point marker. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that that's the difference. It's not that he's not a good player, it's not that he's not producing. It's not that he's not making plays, but you can't go three games without a point if you're gonna want a hundred if you're a hundred point player in the NHL. Well, so uh, give me your excuse. So you know, just so you know, I, I don't even think Artemi Panarin was in the NHL when he was 22 years old. I think he was still in Russia. So there's a lot of time for improvement for Alexi Lafreniere. But what I was gonna say was for the people that like don't watch our show, that don't understand the narrative or the agenda that I've been pushing, uh everyone was commenting on that caption. Like, I think you meant Panarin's close to a hundred points, <laughs> not, not Lafreniere. So that was pretty funny, but um, yeah, no, the Lafreniere stuff has been, has been really, really fun for us. Uh, I feel like we were the first ones to really talk about it. And now it seems like, you know, you, you turn on TSN, you turn on Chicklets, you turn on all these different shows. Everyone's kind of talking about Lafreniere now. And I feel like we kind of started that narrative. No, you, not we, you, you said well, no, but your but your rebuttal, the argument itself, Bucci came on and was like, Oh, I think he's a you know 60 to 70 point guy. You know, Bruce, that's Bruce Boudreau. Bruce Boudreau said 70, yeah. maybe 80. You know, Ryan you Whitney talking. said me may, maybe 80. Okay, maybe you're the only no, person he didn't that say maybe Ryan him. Whitney said he believed 80. He believed okay, 80. but you're you're the only person who's got a good enough strain. Uh, you're you're the, you're smoking a good enough strain to think he's a hundred point guy. You and some of your your Homer Ranger fans. But what about the other drama in that Leafs yeah. Rangers game? Because a lot of people were on different sides of this Matt Rempe situation. Mm -hmm. And this is what everyone was anticipating. It was Rempe versus Reeves the entire week, right? Well, it starts with this hit that he throws on Ilya Labushkin, which actually ended up injuring Labushkin, uh, even though he continues this play. I mean, to me. Yes, I understand the argument that Rempe leaves his feet. I don't think he left them until the contact was made. His he, back he leg comes he up. He didn't leave his feet. He didn't. Well, no, they're, not. They're, you, you, can, you can grab a screenshot where he's in the air. You can. Right, but, but I think I'm after saying, the hit's he made. He didn't, after leave the hit's his made. Feet, he didn't leave his feet to make the hit. No, no, Look, I agree. Let me, let, me, let me say this, okay? Maybe it's a, a charge. Breakdown. So, so, so maybe, maybe it's a charge. Probably I a charge. Agree, no. So he, he, he takes, takes three steps and stops. He takes, he takes about four hard steps and then he stops for a brief second and he coasts into the hit. So that's why I'm saying it's maybe probably a charge. One, two, three, and then stops about two and a half feet out 
and, and he stops moving his feet. So maybe they miss right there. He goes a little wide track Pontiac there for a second. But he, here's what I want to say, and, and people need to understand this, okay? The game of hockey is mostly played on one leg at a time, okay? It really is. Like, when you're skating, you've got one leg on the ice, one leg striding. So you've got your, your, your kind of your glide leg and your push leg, and then it rotates. Okay. So the, a lot of times when you're skating into a hit, okay, or you go to make a hit and you're pushing off with one leg and you're planting with the other and you make contact with a player in the aftermath, one of your feet may come up off the ground. That doesn't mean you jumped and left your feet. Okay. Rempy's a big guy. All right. There's a lot of leverage on these types of plays for the smaller players, right? So I think that he he his feet come his foot comes off the ground, but he doesn't leave his feet to make the hit. Mm -hmm. So I think the NHL got this one right. Maybe you could have called it two minutes for charging. Probably could have. You probably could have, but it it wasn't this dirty, egregious hit. It just wasn't. He's a big mm -hmm. guy. He's a big man. Okay. Hockey's a violent sport. So I know Leafs fans are going to disagree all day long, but I I really had little little problem with the hit. And like I said, fair argument that it could have been a charge. Fair. I'm not saying it's blatant, but fair is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Also, I just want to shout out Jeremiah because he said Alexi Lafreniere has a picture of Colby in his locker with a middle finger and it says to himself, <laughs> I will get 100 points. Good. Listen, um, good but for yeah. him. I hope, he, I hope he does. But also... Continuing with Matt, with Matt Rempe, I know it's become this short, this sort of, you know, I, I don't know what, what we want to call it, like whether it's, uh, I don't want to say the word like gimmick or, or shtick or whatever, because he's fighting a lot, but it seemed to me like he didn't really want to fight Ryan Reeves in this situation, and Reeves sort of baited him into it. Uh, if we can roll that clip, Vic, like Rempe's coming back to the bench, and he looks to the bench and basically is asking for, you know, uh, approval to do this right like it looks to me like he wasn't really interested in fighting ryan reeves but then after the bench whether they signaled at him to do it whether they you know to me it looked like Vinny trotrek was telling him to come back uh i don't know but i thought this fight was you know as good of a fight as we've seen rempy held his own uh it gave the rangers a bit of a momentum boost they were down three to two late in the hockey game they find a way to tie it and uh you know ryan reeves again you know um obviously he wants to Ryan Reeves also wants to stay relevant, right? He understands Matt Rempe's having a moment right now. If Reeves doesn't fight Matt Rempe in this game, I think it does a lot worse things for him than it would for Rempe actually fighting Reeves, if that makes sense. Like, it's more of a negative for Reeves to not fight than it is a positive for Rempe to fight Reeves. Um, and I'm pretty sure he knew that going in. Like, he had asked Rempe earlier in the game if he wanted one. Rempe said no. But I think that hit on Labushkin was kind of uh, something that sparked this fight. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's true. I think there was more, more, especially with, with the heat that Ryan Reeves has been taking in Toronto this year and the yeah. Leafs have been taking for having Ryan Reeves. I think this was um, very necessary for, for Ryan Reeves to do. Um, look, Rempe's a tough kid, but uh, he, he's what one, one and two in his fighting career. Um, like that, yeah. he, he's, he's taken, he's taken a beating. So um, I, I wouldn't, I wonder like, is he going to continue at this pace? Um, look, I just love that there's, there's been some fighting, uh, there's been some big hits, you know, th this is starting to feel like playoff hockey. Mm -hmm. And and I also love all the whiny baby writers crying about fighting and how it's this and it's that, and it shouldn't be allowed. And just another example of all the people who never played any hockey at a high level, um, no better than all the people who have dedicated their entire lives to being on and off the ice and working in and around the NHL who, who love it. I mean, the, the Rangers bench during this fight told you everything you needed to know about how the players feel about Ryan Reeves going in there and, and sticking up for Labushkin and, and whatnot. So um, it, it's, uh, it's good to see it in the game. It really is, um, you know, again, we don't need five on five Donnie Brooks every night, but mm -hmm. but a little bit of hatred from one team to another in a, in a heavyweight matchup, a team that's nine, one and oh, and the other one, eight, one and one in their last 10. 
maybe a potential Eastern Conference final matchup, depending on how things shake out. You do, you know, like so. I, I've really enjoyed uh, the physicality and and sort of the the fighting and the hatred over the last couple of weeks in the NHL. I, I really have. It's and it's there was the hatred on our show that yeah um, we have for one another some days. It's been good. No, it's, it's been very entertaining. And then there's one more controversial play that comes out of that game. I actually agreed with the call. Uh, Mitch Marner's penalty shot, the game-winning penalty shot. Uh, some people thought he lost control of the puck or took a step backwards. I've seen this play happen a million times in an NHL Momentum. Shootout. It's all it's you got to get your momentum. And to me, he goes to the side. He doesn't go backwards. He doesn't, he doesn't lose, lose the puck control. Fully. The puck rolls on him, but then he re... He's he able never to lost kind of, it. Yeah, I'm just saying the puck rolls on him and he's able to re-corral it with the backhand of his stick. I mean, I, I it's funny, Craig and I were texting about that, and and you know, he was wearing his Rangers hat and and didn't like the goal. And I'm like, yeah. I, I liked this one. I uh, I thought I thought this should have been should have been a good goal. But look, let's let's keep moving along here, whoa, Johnny. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But, but but for the Ranger fans that disagree, our Tammy Panarin basically did the same exact move in Minnesota earlier this year, and it was called a good goal. So if you're gonna say this one counts, but that one doesn't, then you're just you know being a Ranger homer. Like you got to be able to to see this thing with a level head and agree that it's basically, I think Panarin's is actually worse. I think that one's worse than that goal counted. So for any Ranger fan that doesn't think the Marner goal should have counted, watch that one and, and then tell me that you disagree because yeah. uh, to me, that's the same goal. If, if Panarin's isn't actually worse. So let's move on. All right. Let's now let's, let's talk about Johnny winning, winning uh, or being right over Colby. How do you want to word it? So Elias Pedersen signs his contract this weekend. Uh, Johnny and I had a bet. The bet was a push. Johnny took the under at 11 and a half, and I took the over, but I gave him 11.6 as the push line. Well, you uh, said you were very adamant about this contract starting with a 12. I, I, and, I, and the I, first honestly, thing you said when it came out was Pedersen should fire his agent. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I got to say this. Isn't it Brisson? Thank God you didn't challenge me more on this because you probably could have won a couple thousand dollars off me. <laughs> like I would have bet you five grand if I thought you could pay up on that. Mm -hmm. I would have bet you that that it would have started with a twelve. Seriously, I would also I would because also never take five grand from you. When when you would take when, it from me, <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> when when William Nylander signs for eleven and a half million dollars, and then Pedersen is up right after that, and all the leverage that I felt like Pedersen had, the trade rumors. Uh, holding out saying I'm not you know waiting and waiting and waiting like for him to turn around and and take a a, a more friendly deal kind of surprised me um you know look we're not talking about he took nine million instead of 15 million he took 11.6 basically to say okay I'm better than William Nylander and more valuable than William Nylander but I'm not going to hold you guys over the barrel but seriously we pushed our bet um, I was willing to give Johnny 12 as the push line, but he didn't want to change the bet after we made it. So credit to you for sticking with your original bet. Mm -hmm. um, but man, you could have beat me for, for a sum of money that you could have used to go ice skating seven days <laughs> a week for the next couple of months with, with all of your, your, your dates in New York city, buddy, because I, I was shocked. I really was like, he, he, to me, he left money on the table. We don't know what the thought process there was, but to me, this felt very team friendly at eleven point six. Like I thought he could have gone all the way up to twelve six. I really did. Well, here's what I was thinking after I saw it too, and I, I don't know if I want to. We, we've kind of gone back and forth about this. I don't know if Johnny I versus Colby, who who would win? What do you I mean, that, Neil? I saw that. Who would in win? Fight. Who would in win? Fight. In what? In a fight. Come on, you're bigger than me. You, you take me. You take me. It wouldn't sure. even be close. Yeah, you take me. For sure. I'm, I'm owing two in my. Four, owing two in my career. Twenty pounds. I I got a lot of height and weight on Johnny Boy. I'm uh five eleven, a Jewish six foot, and I'm like one eighty five, <laughs> sometimes two hundred if I have Taco Bell. Uh, but I I think um, what what were oh Patterson, my my initial thought was, is it a lower number? because of the lack of playoff experience. He's only played in one playoff, and it was the bubble. He did well, 18 points in 17 games. 
But do you think that's also a factor in why he didn't get as much money? Because he hasn't really had much playoff has, experience. Has Austin Matthews know. carried his team through the playoffs yet? But he, he plays well in the playoffs. He scores goals. They've seen what he can do in the playoffs. It's more of a team thing than an individual thing with Austin Matthews, you know? Like, you, you, you know what? I don't think anyone looks at the Leafs and says they're not winning a cup because Austin Matthews isn't performing in the playoffs. Like, I don't think anyone is saying Yeah, but he's, but he's the best player on their team, so he has to go to a whole new level if he wants to take his team to a cup. But, but, but still, Pedersen has only played in the bubble. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think had Pedersen had four years of playoff experience where he's maybe a point a game or, or a little less than that, I think the number is bigger. And I feel like that's something you, everyone would agree with. Yeah, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. He's a premier center. He's 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 a franchise type of center in the NHL. Uh, we talked about, you know, there's there's not there's not every team doesn't even have one of those guys. But a couple of people in the chat are are, are wondering about maybe the hurricane situation with Pedersen. Maybe that gave a little bit of leverage back to the Vancouver Canucks. Vancouver. You know, mm -hmm. maybe maybe Pedersen felt like he didn't want to go to Carolina. And that's pure speculation. You know, look, personally, I don't know why you wouldn't want to go play in Carolina. Um, their their building is is wild in the playoffs. Rod Brindamore is, you know, a premier guy. Uh, he's he's so well respected. Um, so I don't know why that would seem that's a team that's been knocking on the door with, with, with one Elias Pedersen away from a cup. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't want to go there. I don't know why that would be such a turnoff that that would force you into signing, but the timing is interesting. They're explaining, ex exploring a trade with Carolina. They're, they're talking to player and player's agent about it. You got to think Paprasan was in the loop on that. And then all of a sudden he signs and it's for a number, probably a million dollars less, 750000 less than any of us would have thought. So may, maybe Jim Rutherford, Rutherford did have a little bit of tactic um, that, uh, you know, helped in the negotiation. I, I don't know. The whole thing didn't make a lot of sense to me. Let me ask you a question and mm -hmm. be honest about this. And I know you mm -hmm. will be honest about this. When do I when ever lie? Said, <laughs> That's what I mean. Like you don't even yeah. have it in you to to lie. So, <laughs> did you think eleven five was going to win you that bet? Like, how confident no. were you in that number? Because I feel like after you said it, you were like, "Shit." Well, well, no. Well, you made a lot of good points. I even said after I was like, "Oh, I, I kind of regret the number I chose." Because I also, you know, Colby, like you know way more about contract situations than I do. Like I, I've never had to deal with. You don't it. get involved in it. That's not your I, thing. I, but I've also never. I don't really know how much goes into it. I've never signed one. I've never been around one. Um, so like whatever you made your points about it, I was like, Oh, he just like knows more than I do about this. Like maybe I'm wrong here. But, but the point that I, that I was confident about was I know they're trying to sign Heronic as well. I know they have other players that they're obligated to. They're going to try to sign Lindholm. Um, you know, this is a team that's trying to build something where you just have to think, a player like Pedersen isn't going to be selfish and take all the money away from the other guys that are also a priority. Like that's just kind of where my mind was. But when right. it comes down to the actual nitty gritty and the numbers, like I didn't really know. And the cap is going up. So I didn't know how significant that would be to his number. So yes, I wasn't very confident well, in it. But to me also, like I, I, I look at 11.5 and I'm like, Holy shit, that's a lot of money. Like to me, oh, listen, eleven point five or twelve point. You know, course, listen. Yeah, of course it's a lot of money. It's life. I mean, but yeah. the way contracts usually run is is. But I think comparable. you said eleven point five to twelve point five. That's not like a big difference. But a million dollars is it? That's that's a whole other player. You that's know? eight. That's eight million dollars over the course of the contract. Yeah. Okay. Um. But you're right. And if maybe a, if if one player takes a million dollar discount and then a couple of guys take a four or five hundred thousand dollar discount, that's your money to, to continue yeah. to add up. So look, um, Jim the Swede in our chat said, as a Swede, I can tell you, Petey is a humble kid. He would take a fair cap number to stay long term. He wants to win. Look, I I think he 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 could have gouged them for more money. I think we mm -hmm. all agree on that. It's a it's a topic that every player, every fan, every coach. Everybody can agree on the fact that he could have taken more money and he didn't. So good for him. I love to see guys get paid, Johnny. We do need to keep moving. 
Um, we're, well, we're, I just want to read one one quote. David Roth just wrote in the chat. Uh, in quotes, I don't know who said this, but you make your money in the regular season, you make your name in the playoffs. It's a good quote like that. It's and listen, there's a lot of truth to that because you don't get yeah. paid in the playoffs. Your salary yeah. ends the day the playoff starts, and there's no you're not getting your salary in the playoffs. You're getting uh, shares of a bonus depending on how much your team does, and the money again, winning the cup, guys. You know you're you're not looking. You're not, players don't make millions of dollars to win the Stanley mm -hmm. Cup. You know, you're talking more yeah. like 100, 150,000, something like that to win it all. And it gets divided, you know, a few million dollars gets divided by all the players um, and staff. And that's how they do playoff shares. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was a, on a roster for a Stanley Cup and and I, I I saw how that all gets broken down and and made some money in the playoffs when I didn't expect to. Um, so... Good for I him. I also just want to say one more thing. Uh, Ducksco wrote, hey, Johnny and Kobe, Frank Petrano is on goal number 29. Buds, do you still see him being moved this week? We'll talk about Frank Petrano specifically tomorrow when we have uh, Frank Sarabelli on. So we'll get into all the trade stuff tomorrow. Um, just for anyone who has trade questions, let, let's just save those for tomorrow's show when we have yeah, okay. Frank Sarabelli on because we'll, we'll dive in deep into it. So um, I just um, want to put that out there. We're just going to mention – Kuznets off and his situation. Um, he's going down to Hershey. He went on waivers. Uh, he's, got, he's got like an $8 million cap hit. I think I saw uh, someone reliable tweeted that's the, the highest cap hit for a player in the minors um, ever. Uh, the other thing is, little little business note here for everybody, he'll actually make more money playing in Hershey than he will in Washington um, because you don't pay escrow. So whatever escrow is this year, 10, is it 11 or 12% this year? 11%, something like that. Sure. He will meet, he will make 11% more of that 7.8 million or his salary is actually six this year. I think I saw he had a $2 million signing. So his $6 million salary, he'll get 11 or 12% more of that in the minors. So his paychecks will actually be bigger in Hershey than they will be in Washington obviously different tax situations in Washington versus Hershey. So that comes into play as well, but um, he'll make more money playing in Hershey. It's good to see him back. That situation seems like it'll come to a head, <coughs> excuse me, this summer and, and he'll, they'll try to trade him. He's got one more year left at 7.8 cap hit. So they might have to eat money to get someone to take that on. Who, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. Let's get into tonight really quick, Johnny. There's a couple of really good games tonight. We're also going to debut a new segment for us um, uh, with our new sponsor partner, Betway. Um, but but let's let's talk about a couple of the games first, Johnny, before we bring in and we introduce our betting expert for the show. We thought about we thought about using Johnny as our betting expert on the show, but if you follow Johnny and you follow his bets, you know that he's anything but a betting expert. So we wanted to get somebody in here that that is a little bit better than Johnny. Um, or there's a regulation last night, we'll, not a sweat, not a we'll, sweat. So, so we'll get to that in a second. But what do you what do you got on the slate tonight, Johnny? Six games. What do you what are you looking at? I mean, you know the game I'm watching. I'm going to uh, the Florida Panthers morning skate as soon as we wrap up the show here. Rangers Panthers in New York. I, I think this is as much of a a measuring stick as you can get for the Rangers. Florida is the consensus team to beat right now i think not only in the eastern conference but in the entire nhl the rangers have been playing a bit more of a physical in your face kind of style which is exactly the style that florida plays so i think tonight is going to be just a, a huge uh you know maybe inkling of what we might see come playoff time and you know is matt rempe gonna fight again tonight i i hope not to be honest <laughs> like, give the kid a rest um yeah but do i want him to be physical one thousand percent. I actually said I didn't mean this as a as a take. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are saying that Rempe won't be on the roster after the trade deadline happens and once the Rangers make their moves. But if you're playing the Florida Panthers in the playoffs, uh, you, you need Matt Rempe in the lineup. Yeah, you need him there. We'll see. I, I, maybe, maybe it depends what they do at the deadline. And, yeah, and the I was going to ask you. Them. I was going to ask you what I thought you'd do, but we'll wait because we have yeah. Frank tomorrow. So let's yeah. let's wait. Save the Ranger conversation for tomorrow. Yeah, um, that's look, really, I mean, I'll be there. So that's the only game I'll, I'll be watching tonight. A couple other games, I think, that are kind of under the radar. I think St. Louis, Philly, Flyers need to win. They need to win hockey games if they want to stay on in the playoffs. Like, they need to continue to win games, especially against a team like St. Louis, who's on the outside looking in. 
How about Vegas and Columbus? Vegas needs to win this game, man. They they have not played good hockey. The Oilers have passed them yeah. um, in the West. It's it's not been a great, let's call it, eight weeks for Vegas. I know Jack Eichel's back on the ice skating. I'm not sure if he's back playing yet, to be 100% certain, but I don't think he is. They're without Mark Stone, their, their captain, their leader. They lost um, five or six. It, and they it's just got not smoked good. by Buffalo. Yeah. And I and I know what Bruce Cassidy's like when you're losing hockey games, man. He 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 he's a running commentary guy on the bench, and, and that gets old when you're not winning. So I think that's an undercover huge game for Vegas against a bad Columbus team. Ken Johnson's out for the year, uh Torres Labram in his shoulder. Um, so I think that's another undercover game. And, and then there, there's another big boy tilt tonight. All right. There is another big boy tilt tonight. Uh, Boston and Toronto. That brings us into our Betway bet of the day. The new segment that we are airing on this show. We'll be doing it every day um, towards the end of the show. We're going to bring in our producer, Vic, who's a, who's a big time better. Uh, must be 19 years of age or older. Ontario only. And please play responsibly. And I, I repeat, please play responsibly. 19 years or older and Ontario only. Um, we're going to look at that Boston-Toronto game. Uh, we'll introduce you to, to the voice <laughs> behind the scenes of our show. We're always asking Vic uh, to, to, to bring things up for us. Um, he's our producer. Also an avid better, an avid Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Uh, so take that for what you will. Um, and like I said, we couldn't use Johnny for this because his bets are terrible. So let me <laughs> let me uh, – Give it over to my man, Vic, and, and let's hear what you're thinking about for tonight, Vic. All right. I know what, I'm, what everybody thinks, where everybody thinks I'm leaning, but uh, Colby, you and I, you, usually we agree on a lot of things, So, uh, <laughs> we could, but we couldn't agree on who's going to actually win this game. But when we started looking at the numbers, uh, we're actually going to say that this game is going to overtime. So tie after third period is the best bet of the day today. Uh, Boston's gone to overtime 22 times this year, most in the NHL. Toronto, third most in the NHL with 19. Uh, this is their third meeting of the season. Both meetings, uh, one Boston one in November in overtime, one they won in a shootout in December. So we're going to take Boston, Toronto to go to overtime. And that's our best bet of the day. And look, the lines will change all day, but all I will tell you right now, it's a juicy, juicy bet. I mean, you can win good money on this bet if you get it in early and get it in now. And look, both of these teams have gone to overtime all season. Both of these teams hate each other. They're going to play tighter. They're going to play heavier. They're going to want to win this game. Okay, it's is it in Toronto? I believe yes, it's it in is. Toronto. Yes, it's it is. in Toronto. We're gonna probably see Joseph Wall in net. Um, yeah. I would oh, think. I, <laughs> I, I would think. But I look, it's I, I like this pick tonight because I have no idea who's gonna win this game. I think Toronto probably wins the game. They've been playing way better than Boston has. But when you look at the history, these games are going to overtime all season for both of these two teams. And mm -hmm. I always like an opportunity to win a bunch of money without having to bet a ton of money. So um, that's our bet of the day. Our, our bet way bet of the day um, must be 19 years of age or older, Ontario only. And please play responsibly. We will be bringing Vic in at the end of every show to continue to get a bet of the day. Hopefully he can win you all some money. Thanks, Vic. Good, uh, good camera debut there for our boy. Um, I actually just saw uh, a little Bleacher Report open ice. It looks like they're interviewing Crosby, talking about the bigger picture, and he looks pretty frustrated talking about the bigger picture going into the trade deadline. Um, there's a lot of news coming out right now, Colby. I don't know if you want to dive into this or kind of just like uh, you know talk about the tweet of the night and just wrap up today's show and kind of save this stuff for tomorrow. Um, just let's, scroll let's, on Twitter here. Let's, uh, let's let it get juicy and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive into it tomorrow. So what do we, uh, what do we got for our tweet of the night? So the tweet of the night, I don't know if anyone saw it, but Steve Ott, uh, who is one of the assistant coaches for the St. Louis blues was behind the bench, looking up at the jumbotron and saw his son Maverick, uh, mm -hmm. doing the shirtless dance. So one of the funniest videos, I think around Twitter all day yesterday, um, he had a hard time holding in his laugh 
I wouldn't be able to control myself if it was my kid in the situation. Um, <laughs> but what a hilarious video. Look at Steve Ott's face here as he realizes it's his kid. <laughs> he's trying to, to hold back the last there. But uh, man, he's, he's probably see, uh, hoping that, that, like that nobody on the bench realizes it. And and I'll give you a quick Steve Ott story. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I played against Steve Ott when he was in Dallas. Uh, I think it was my probably my played him in preseason and then i'm pretty sure my first game he was still in dallas in the nhl and he talks so much shit on the ice steve ott oh my god mm -hmm. does he talk so much shit um and and he was kind of jarring with me a little bit in that first game and uh years later about i guess maybe six five six years ago um kevin shattenkirk's wedding um which which uh, you know, Nick Benino and I and his brothers were his his groomsmen and his, you know, we kind of shared best man duties or whatever. And Steve Ott actually officiated Shaddy's wedding. Um, oh, wow. And so the lead up and the rehearsal and and the day of, you know, he is like one of the funniest guys I've ever been around, Steve Ott. I mean, he had us cracking up. He was super nervous to officiate the wedding. I was calling him Rabbi Ott. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we were sitting at the winery um, and, and getting ready to go out there. And he was like nervous and sweating. I mean, it was a big wedding. Shadi invited a lot of people to that wedding. A lot of hockey guys were there. So he just didn't want to screw up. But he he's, he's funny. And, and he remembers it all. Like every time he talks shit. Like we were talking about the one time we played against each other in the regular season and the shit that he said to me, and he remembered all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not going to get into what he said, but, but he remembered all of it. I mean, he's, he's a funny guy, Steve Ott. So, uh, that, that was a funny tweet. I actually, uh, it kind of reminds me of my own personal story, not, not to do with, with Steve Ott, but like, just like, I guess kind of like an embarrassing moment. I think you'll appreciate this. My freshman year, we were playing on the road at UConn. We lost like three or four to one. Coach Carve ripped us in the locker room after for our performance. And, you know, as we're on the bus pulling away, my mom and my best friend's mom had come to the game to watch. And, you know, I'm a freshman. Like, they don't know any better. The bus is pulling away, and my mom and my best friend's mom are waving at the bus like this. Like, like we're leaving for the first day of day camp, and we're five years old. And I hear the seniors in the back of the bus like, whose fucking mom is that? <laughs> and I was like sitting in my chair, like, Oh my God. Like, like that's so Aaron, bad. Like, we Aaron. literally just got ripped apart for 45 minutes in the locker. My mom's waving. Like I'm going to the first day of fucking camp. <laughs> it's so funny. Karen, but, uh, Karen, come on, come on. I feel like Steve Ott might've had that. Like, Oh, whose fucking kid is that? You know, um, so, some kind of, you know, funny moment like that. But, uh, yeah, my mom, my mom always like didn't really understand how serious hockey was. Like I remember in junior one time we were down by one, like a minute left. She comes, she like came behind the bench to like wave hi to me as like Coach Lafontaine's drawing up a play in the last minute. I'm like, yeah, you gotta realize that this is a real thing here. Like, you gotta read the yeah. room. Gotta read the yeah, room. Read the room mom. Gotta but, love uh, it though. I mean, look, yeah. I've talked to your mom a couple of times now on Facetime with you guys, and what? she's she's uh. <laughs> She's when what? you FaceTime me and uh, <laughs> yeah, be clear you about tell. that. <laughs> you, you can, you can tell where, where you get your, your positive, happy energy from you. Yeah. You can tell it, it, com it comes from mom. So, um, those are, those are easy to believe stories. Yeah, so fuck you, dad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you should never swear at your parents, Johnny, just like you shouldn't swear at my one-year-old, which you've, you've already done that as yeah. well. I'm learning. I'm learning. Never change, but continue to progress, as they say. Uh, that's going to wrap up today's show, though. It was a fun one. Tomorrow is going to be, you know, I imagine loaded trade deadline talk with Frank Saravalli. Um, but we got a fun week ahead with the trade we'll, deadline coming up on Friday. We'll we'll try to keep him as long as we can. And to be honest, we're, we're going to have a loose agenda with Frank tomorrow. So if you guys have questions and, and want to be heard, get in early um, and, and, you know, Give us your questions because we'll. Uh... <laughs> Ducks go. You saw that comment. <laughs> yeah, let's clarify that real quick. <laughs> um... <laughs> All right. Yeah. So tomorrow will be fun. We'll be back here at 9 a.m. Um, you know, tweet at us if you see a funny tweet of the night, tweet of the day. Um, you know, we're always looking for funny stuff to feature on the show. We want to see uh, our listeners' tweets. We're also trying to figure out like a hashtag, maybe if you want to tweet at us. Um, and don't be afraid to send in your questions for Frank tomorrow, whether 
you want to tweet at us or get in the chat early, um, you know, we'll happily ask your questions. So have a great day, everybody. There's a lot of good hockey on tonight. Uh, let us know if you're taking that Toronto Wait, and Boston Johnny, let me draw. just let, let me give you one more thing. I saw this on Twitter under your your show tweet. All good topics, but more importantly, how the rained out ice skating take. <laughs> Who said that? I didn't see that. Alex Alex Dudley. Um, Alex. He tweet he tweeted that at you. So people are invested in your yeah. love life, Johnny. They're they're yeah. invested in your love life. So we'll we'll see. Maybe by the end of the week, we'll do we'll do a Johnny's love life update. Supposed to have the fourth date on Thursday night, so we'll see. Maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll tell you guys the game plan for the date on Thursday, and you guys can can help me decide what to do. Um, but let's just wrap up this show because I feel like we've tried it now three times. Have a great have a great day, everybody. Thanks to our producer Vic, who you now know what he looks like. Um, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Saravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.